Hi, I'm Chris Sarandon, and welcome to Cooking by Heart. Just the best. I couldn't believe the tastes and the flavors. Lydia Bastianich. Hi, Chris. Where we revisit the vivid memories of the food we grew up with and the people and the stories attached to that time in our lives. <laughs> Today, my guest is the woman the New York Times has hailed as the Broadway musical's undisputed queen, quote, end quote. The queen's name is Kelly O'Hara. Having appeared in 11 Broadway shows, for which she has garnered seven Tony nominations, and having won one Tony for the Best Leading Actress in a Musical, along with a Grammy, Drama League, and Outer Critics nomination for her portrayal as Anna in The King and I, on Broadway, of course, and she was also nominated for a prestigious Olivier Award when she repeated the role of Anna in London's West End. Among her other Broadway credits are Kiss Me Kate, The Bridges of Madison County, South Pacific, Pajama Game, The Light in the Piazza, all of which garnered her Tony nominations. She has made history as the first Broadway artist to cross over to the Metropolitan Opera, first in The Merry Widow, opposite Renee Fleming, and has followed that by leading roles at the Met in Mozart's Cosi Fan Tutti, and more recently in The Hours. She is an acclaimed concert artist and a frequent performer on PBS television broadcasts, the Kennedy Center Honors, and has received an Emmy nomination for her role on The Accidental Wolf on Topic Television, and she can currently be seen in the HBO series The Gilded Age. She recently starred in the critically acclaimed new musical The Days of Wine and Roses Off-Broadway, a production that will open on Broadway in January of 2024. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm thrilled to present the Queen of Broadway, <laughs> Kelly O'Hara. Hi, Kelly. Hi, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> the traveling woman. How are That's you today? That's right. I'm, I'm good. I'm glad to be here with you. Uh, oh, well, we're thrilled to have you. We're thrilled to have you. So usually I start these, um, these little episodes with a, a question to my guest, which sort of leads into where we're going. And that is provenance, where we're from, because it tells us a lot about the food we grew up with, the parents, et cetera, et cetera. So you were born where and raised? I was born in Tulsa, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. raised in Elk City, Oklahoma, which is on the west side of the state, and then ended up in central Oklahoma when we moved when I was in high school. And I finished high school there, went to college, Oklahoma City University. And the rest, mm. I, when I moved, the rest is history. Mm. So your early years were spent where, in Tulsa or in Elk City? Elk City. I mean, we lived in a uh, Broken Arrow area until I was three, and then we mm -hmm. moved, so I don't remember that. So right. all of my formative years that I can remember were mostly in Elk City, Oklahoma. So tell me a little about mom and dad. <laughs> uh, my mom is, uh, was a school teacher yeah. for her whole career, retired um, now. My dad was a, a, a CPA out of college and starting law school. And then we moved back to Elk City because his father became ill and he went home literally to farm the family farm. Oh, wow. To take over with his brother and help their dad. And so as a kid, I grew up on a farm and it wasn't until he was in his 40s that he went back to school to finish mm. that law degree. Mm -hmm. And he has since been a practicing attorney and a rancher. Oh, oh, so he had a renaissance in his life as well. He sure did. All right. So tell me then, let's go back to, uh, now it was, uh, was the farm in Elk City? Yes, yeah, still is. Still is. And what was that like? What was, what was mo mom obviously was, was she the homemaker while she, she was, wasn't teaching? That's right. And I should also just point out when I say my dad went back to school, my mother was the homemaker as well as a full-time job, but she was also going to night school at night to finish her degrees and get a master's degree. And so there was a lot of example wow. in the house of, of parents. They started really young. They had their first child at 19. Were you the first? No, I was last. I was the baby. How many siblings? <laughs> I have an older brother and older sister. So there's ah, three. Okay. I had good examples in my house of people continuing on and following their dreams. Sense of achievement. Mm -hmm. Was mom a good cook? Yes. My mother is an incredible cook. She's definitely where the, the food has passed down. Although she soaked up my dad's side as much as she could from my dad's mom, who was a wonderful cook too. But my mom comes from that, from women who were raised in Arkansas. So we ah. have Southern, Southern root cooking. 
Right. Going all the way back, of course, you know that where that influence is, and we've got those beautiful recipes of, of you know, briskets and and cheese grits and mm-hmm. <laughs> and and things like that. So we yep. we still eat those uh, regularly. My background was a, a, a very kind of eclectic mix of Greek at home, mm. but then sort of traditional Appalachian. Uh, food during the day at my because my dad owned a restaurant and he couldn't serve Greek food. He had to serve food for the coal miners who lived nearby. So our food was a very much of a of a uh, an eclectic mix. But we I, I do remember very vividly whenever breakfast was served at the restaurant, grits was always on the plate. Always, always. Breakfast was grits with you know butter and sugar, and right. uh, dinner was grits with you know a baked cheese grits. Right. So that was the starch staple? Yeah, or potatoes because, you know, O'Hara. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right, right. Lots and lots of potatoes. What was the typical day around the dinner table? What was your, for instance, let's talk about breakfast. Your, your typical breakfast was a farm breakfast? Well, my dad's would have definitely been. I mean, my grandma, was she was famous for having full meals at every single meal on the table. Talk about her a little bit. One of the most, the biggest influences of my life, just the most incredible, smart, intelligent woman who really put everything aside to be a farm wife, to raise mm-hmm. four kids. Yep. They lived out on this farm that, as I mentioned, my dad came back to farm. She was the kind of person who they literally, they raised the chickens, she'd fry them up. You know, she had biscuits or, a, you know, a stack of bread that she made with every meal. You had garden vegetables. You had, if in the morning you had maybe had chicken fried steak. You had eggs, you had gravy, white gravy. My dad used to say if we didn't have time, if we were running, doing our chores and then running to school, you know, she'd wrap up a sandwich, an egg sandwich, something up in a towel or a whatever and send them off to school. That it was never, they were never going to start their day without, I mean, a hearty, a hearty breakfast. Yeah. Meat breakfast, eggs, bacon, sausage, whatever that was. Because there there was hard work that followed. Oh yeah, and or, or even preceded it. I mean, oh, my dad, prece- he they definitely grew up waking up early, early in the mornings to do a lot of chores before they went to school. You know, I got off easy being the third kid. My brother grew up this way. My own, so the next generation, my dad passed that down. My brother woke up before school every morning. He had a lot of livestock that he tended to. I mean, he was driving a tractor by the time he was nine or ten. Wow. My sister and I chopped cotton. You know, all my childhood. Hmm. But I definitely admit that I was not one of those getting up early, early, early uh, before school to do my right. chores like my brother did. So you weren't out milking the cows at 4 a.m.? No, and we didn't have dairy cows. That was one of the best. I, I was very grateful for that because that's early, <laughs> that's early morning business. <laughs> right. <laughs> very early morning business. Yeah. Right, right. So typical breakfast was c- considerable. So you had... Oh, start the day off big, you know. And I think that that's, that passes down to me. I mean, I'm a big, huge, savory breakfast person. Yeah, me I'm too. I'm big, you know, have a, a few bites of fruit. You know, I wake up and have a, a big old, I mean, these days it's transformed itself to, you know, maybe a big bowl of, you know, brown rice, egg, vegetables, mm-hmm. avocado. Right. My dad still likes a big hearty breakfast with, you know, if you go stay with him, he'll make, he calls it scratch gravy, you know, and it's his white Flour gravy over mm-hmm. over sausage or biscuits, yeah. Yep, yep, exactly. So, so not, uh, something was ne- not necessarily then rendered from stock. It was just pure out water, flour. Yeah, no, yeah. Salt well, what and he pepper. Do is saute up the, the sausage and then take that out and use, use all the that. grease. Absolutely. Yeah. Use all. Use all the grease. Use everything. Make yep. a roux, pour some yep. milk in there, some fl- you know, and then you've got your gravy, lots of pepper, things like that. Yeah, salt exactly. Pepper. Before you started off to school, do you remember what it was like around the house during the day in terms of the, the kind of general meal preparation? Or was that too early? Because when I was growing up, my mother had the same schedule as I did. You know, we were racing out the door trying to just get to school. And then, of course, lunch was at school. It wasn't until dinner came around that the, you know, the bigger meals would come. But if you were in my, my dad's mom's house, my grandma's house, because she wasn't leaving to go, it was very popular in my high school that my grandma would provide a big lunch for many of us kids because she lived near the high school. Oh. And walk over to her house and she'd make, she would probably have six to eight to 10 kids around her to table. And she'd have at noon, she'd have. Fried chicken and mashed potatoes and gravy and wow, 
you know, boiled pot green beans with the ham hock in, you know, that had been slow cooked. This is extraordinary. And, yeah, she would do this every day. She'd always, no matter what meal it was, she'd have a stack of white bread sitting in the middle of the table yep. because you got to sop it up. You got to sop it up. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Now, who got to who who got to decide who the lucky few were that got, got to go to Grandma's house? Our friends would fight over it. We we started I with I mean, just that my cousins and I I would go over. So there were about three or four of us and my sister, and then it started to become where we would maybe bring a friend, and then my older cousin Brad, his name, he started bringing three or four friends, and then it got to be too much. And I remember <laughs> my dad and my uncle sitting us down and being like, "Let's not abuse your grandma." Right. She's like, exactly. Being abused. Yeah. Right. Right. She sounds like a, a hale and hearty woman. Oh, you know, yes, yeah, she was. She was, especially in her in her youth. I mean, as she got older, she was this tiny little woman that would cook mm -hmm. all this food and not eat much of it. As you can probably imagine, I was I definitely looked different when I lived in Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I actually probably needed to start. Thankfully, I would go straight to basketball practice and, you know, right. work, work it off. off. Right. But um, Oh, I ate well in Oklahoma. I really ate well. Yeah. Oh, I remember very vividly when I was a kid, uh, I, I worked in my dad's restaurant uh, and either we would we would either eat in the restaurant with my father when he was on the evening shift or he would eat at home uh, one week, one week off, one week on. So when I was at the restaurant, either working or eating at the restaurant, I could have anything I wanted. So by the time I was 12 or 13, you know, and there were always fresh pies, cobblers, cakes, oh. um, yeah. uh, ice cream. Uh, I, I went through those very seriously uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, they put me on a diet when I was like 12 or 13 years old because I was, you know, uh, I well, got a little. Listen, as a girl, uh, you know, and I don't mean to, you know, make it different between a boy and a girl, but my, I guess my mom could have been concerned, but to her credit, and I've thought about this a lot as a mother of a girl or mm -hmm. a mother of any child, a boy and a girl. Actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My mother never said anything to me. She yeah. just. When I looked back at pictures and I saw myself as this really chubby kid who was made fun of and, you know, bullied. Oh, really? I said, oh, yeah, I still have all that in my heart. I said to my mom one time, I got really angry with her. I was probably about 16 by this time. Mm -hmm. I had gone through puberty and things changed and I was really active in sports and things. And I said, how did you, why did you let me do that? Why did you let me get that way? And she just looked at me and she said, I just thought you were beautiful. Wow. And, and she, I, I uh. think about that a lot because... She really instilled just, she didn't care, yeah. you know? And, and also an appreciation. Yeah, an appreciation for who you are. Yeah, it wasn't until I got to college and, you know, in the theater department and the dance department when everybody was so neurotic about it that I thought, <laughs> oh gosh, I guess I'm supposed to be neurotic about this. Right, <laughs> right. But I still have a pretty healthy relationship with it as long as I, you know, take care of myself and try yeah. to eat healthy. You know? Right. And as you well, know, as we get older, we, we want to feel better too. Yes, exactly. And also, I think a, a, a lot of people, one of the things I wanted to talk about sort of uh, subsequently, but since we're into it now, uh, one of the things I think a lot of people don't understand about doing a particularly a Broadway schedule of eight mm. shows a week over a period of uh, sometimes a year, two years, three years, that you have to, in a way, uh, behave like an athlete. Uh, in the sense that you have to watch everything you eat. You have to be very careful about exposing yourself to, I mean, you can speak to this, please. No, I was just going to say, it's funny you say that. I mean, I'm not the only one, but you just said it. I have often said being on Broadway is like being a professional athlete. Yeah. The only difference is, is we don't get an off season. Yeah, right. <laughs> we don't right. ever get a rest. Yeah. Uh, we don't even get holidays or weekends. And yeah, so right. there's not, it's not, a, it's not as if we're gearing to the national championship. No, uh, there's there's no end, and then and especially you know if you're if you're going to liken the the Tonys to that, you have a show. You know that's on a Sunday. You have a show on Tuesday, so there's yeah. no or Monday or Tuesday. So there's no slowing down. And one of the things you can't afford to do is put your body into turmoil yeah. when you need to be you know working at a certain level. And so I get on the mo I'm the most disciplined when I'm in a Broadway show. I, yeah, I me tend too. To eat similar things every day. I tend to have a a, an exercise or stretch regimen that I never, never pass up. And right. I don't drink alcohol as much. I certainly don't. You know what? I just, I have to. It's the only way to succeed. It's the only way you can survive. That's it's schedule. the only way to survive. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if you're, you're, you're playing a big role and you're doing yeah. a, and, and singing, which makes and, a big difference. 
singing is the the biggest difference. Like I yeah. can't eat dairy for an entire run of a show because yeah. it's the phlegm. You know, it's just there's yeah. a lot of rules for me. Yeah, yeah. What was it like around the dinner table for you guys? What was the conversation like? Well, you know, it was very um, traditional, typical Oklahoma. You know, we would start with a prayer at our table for mm -hmm. sure every time. That's that's sort of how I grew up. And how were you raised? Were you raised uh, Roman Catholic or Protestant? I was raised Catholic in a very, very, you know, Baptist Bible Belt. So right. it that taught me a lot as well. I mean, we could that's a whole other podcast just about acceptance and openness, which uh, my family was always on the open end of things. And it was it was an interesting thing to learn at an early age. So, uh, yeah, I was. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by the uh, open end? Oh, this grandmother that I speak of, this mm -hmm. amazing woman, you know, she was disowned by her entire family for the rest of her life right there in the same small town for marrying a Catholic man. Wow. And so I was taught at a very young age that things like that, like religion, would never get in the way of mm. yeah. love and decency. And that was something I set my mind to very, very early on. That will never happen again. I will never repeat that sort of thing because of the pain that caused. Yeah. My dad will say we were a little bit of cafeteria Catholics. <laughs> I'm so grateful for it. I learned to sing in the Catholic church. You know, I started mm -hmm. cantering at like age nine or 10 and mm -hmm. I'm a little lapsed, I'll admit. <laughs> but it's, I'm grateful for the traditions and the, the family aspect of that, that yeah. unit growing up, we definitely were respectful of all of that. And, you know, we would start our dinner tables with a prayer. We did have dinner every, every night. I mean, you know, a lot of people talk about the pandemic and what good came out of it. And a couple for me, a couple of things were we had dinner. I had dinner with my kids and my husband every single night. Every night. Okay. Yeah. And if and you're doing a show, you don't have that, you don't have well, that option. I haven't in years yeah. and it was really special. And so we still try to do it when we can, because everybody's mm -hmm. gotten busy again. But yeah, my dad, sometimes, sometimes what was interesting about the way I grew up and the kind of work my dad did was that many times, if it wasn't at the table, it was always packed and it was always a tailgate out by the side of the one of the fields. Ah. And I remember what the food was because my mom had to make it for, you know, several people. If it was my dad and his brother, if it was my, my brother and his cousin, the pickup truck would fold down and she'd have, you know, some sort of meat. You know, I grew up on a cattle farm, so it's always going to be some sort of steak or hamburgers or beef or even, you know, pork chops or whatever that was. Right, right. And then it was, she'd make something like rig potatoes, they called them. Big old pot pans of, of you know, cheesy baked potatoes. Mm -hmm. A lot of things that were not healthy, like iceberg wet salads with, yes. you know, with blue cheese dressing. Blue cheese dressing. Yep. So... Those were quick meals that were brought out to the farm. And, and it was a very sort of old, old fashioned when I think back to it, because it was my sister and me and my mom cooking all the food yep. and taking it to my brother and my dad and my uncle and my cousin. Were working in the field? They were working. They'd literally, we'd, we'd see the tractor coming down and they would do one more row and they'd come mm. down and then they'd jump off and they'd have dinner and they'd go back to work. Harvest time, obviously, yes. Harvest time was when we had to do that. And it was yep. daily. And actually, as a kid, I really remember looking very forward to it. And I'd jump in and I'd take a, a few rounds with my dad. I'd sit on mm -hmm. the side the side of the seat. That was my childhood, really. Food in my family, it's nice to talk about it because it's a huge part of what we do. And to, to bring it, to connect it to Broadway, my parents and my whole family, my opening night gift, every show I've ever done, was a big Southern meal. Uh for my entire cast and crew, for King and I, we fed over 250 people between shows on a Saturday before we what? opened. Wow. <laughs> or right after we opened. That was my gift. I sent everybody an invitation. My mom makes little names like, right. you know, like uh, getting to know you grits or whatever. You know? <laughs> and we fed it between shows. We did a, my whole family, you know, cousins, aunts and uncles. We made all this food. A farm style dinner? Yeah. And brisket from our own beef. Ah. My dad oh, how extraordinary. Old, yeah, big old things of barbecue brisket, and we had big spinach salads, big Southern meal, you know. Right, right. This is full disclosure for our audience. Uh, at a point, I was in the light in the piazza with Kelly, and yeah. there was Sunday breakfast. Yes, yes. Where everybody would bring something, I, something I from home. That. And there's something about that sense of, uh, first of all, you're working with these people 
every night for extended periods of time, obviously, when you're doing a, a show that's ongoing. But there's a time when uh, if you do this particular thing where people bring in food and you have a brunch before a matinee on Sunday, there's something about how it changes the relationship with your yeah. fellow cast members and it yeah. makes it mo much more familial. Yes. I mean, you do become family, you know? Yeah. You become family, but this, but the, the introduction of food is an yeah. essential sort of uh, glue, in yeah. a way, uh, to, to any community, really. Yeah. It's not surprising that you're becoming this family and all of a sudden you think, we need meals together. Yes. You know? so yeah. Then you're like, how can we have Sunday potluck brunches? Yeah. How can we go out for dinner you know, between shows or maybe yep. after a show? Yeah. You have to add those familial things in. Yeah, exactly. So, so then you were, you were split. That is harvest time. You were out in the field. You were there with a the pickup truck. You were helping as a kid serve yeah. the food, prepare the food. Yeah. Which is something also that I think uh, I, I constantly talk about this in the podcast about involving your kids in the food preparation, preparing dinner when you're preparing breakfast, that it, it, it binds the family in such a unique way. Yeah. And, and an important way. Yeah. And then at home, what were your mom, what were mom's specialties? Were there things that you look forward to that mom made? Oh yeah. We wait for Thanksgiving all year because she is the ah, most amazing. She makes yeah. these, we call it dressing, you know, not the stuffing, but like a dressing. She makes yep. the best Turkey I've ever, you know, she's famous for it. And um, we wait for it all year. And she has a lot of different dishes that she makes. Mm -hmm. Event cooking, like she's the best corned beef and cabbage on St. Ah, Patrick's Day. Yeah. You know, cooker. She makes d amazing roasts and things for Christmas holiday. Mm -hmm. But on, in the day in and day out, I mean, she would make all sorts of things, pasta dishes. She would make this thing that she called no peak chicken that we loved, <laughs> and rice and chicken dish. Big on smothered stuff, smothered pork chops we'd have. Very Southern. Yeah. Very Southern. Uh, still very Southern. They still cook that way. And sometimes, you know, when I go home, I think, gosh, it's, you know, I, I'm going to come home to eat this kind of stuff. I haven't <laughs> eaten it well. Right. She would make amazing lasagnas and... Very eclectic. Yeah. yeah. Amazing Italian stuff. People would ask for her lasagnas. You know, she came up here to visit me a couple of times and my neighbor, she made one for him one time. Single guy lived next door to me and every time she'd come up, he'd say, will you make me a lasagna? <laughs> <laughs> amazing big pots of beef stew or, or uh, chicken noodle soup that was just the most medicinal and delicious thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She was the queen of comfort. She's the ah. queen of comfort cooking. Oh, yeah. Sure. Was, was she a baker as well? But that's the thing. She'll say, I, I don't, you can just take the baking with you. She's, <laughs> you, know, you know what she is? She's a, a little bit of this, a little bit of that cook, and yep. it's passed down through generations. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't like the exactitude of, like, of measurements. But I have an aunt who, well, I call her my aunt. She's my mom's cousin. She's the baker. And so she'd make peach cobblers and cookies and cakes. Mm. So the mm. two of them would put their power together and we would do right. these Broadway show parties. Yeah. Oh, sounds wonderful. Sounds yeah. wonderful. As you mentioned, and I think a lot of us grew up with, with uh, moms and or dads like this, uh, there were no measurements. No. I've had conversations. I've done a couple of live podcasts with, uh, I did one with Jacques Pepin and with uh, Lydia Bastianich, and they talk a lot about, and if you watch them, I, I know they're very specific about their recipes when they're describing them. Yes. But Jacques wrote a, a wonderful memoir about his being an apprentice uh, as a cook when he was 13 years old and moving up through the ranks. And he talked about the fact that in any great French restaurant that he ever worked in, and he's worked in some of the greatest ever in the world, that there were never any measurements, that you had to stand and watch the chef and figure it out. Wow. wow. That there was no list for you. Yeah. It was all observation. I've actually often asked my mom if she would write a lot of things down. And she has a little bit over the years just so that we don't lose them. But even in the, in the chicken scratch, it's like, oh, about a handful of this. And she'll get frustrated. She'll say, I don't know. I don't, yeah. I don't have, it's not like a teaspoon of this or a cup yeah. of that. And it's sort of what I love about it because I'm, I cook a lot and I love to cook, but I'm my age and I still call my mom. In a way, I wonder, are you doing this just so we'll always, I'll, I'll always need you. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'll still call my mom and I'll say, okay, talk, walk me through that again, you know, because I, you told me last year and I forgot because we didn't write it down. Yeah. She's like, no, we're not going to write it down. You yeah, know? 
Exactly. Exactly. And the same thing happens when I get together. We do a big Thanksgiving dinner as well with my kids, their mom, her family, because she now has a, a, a an extended, they, my kids have stepbrothers and stepsisters, uh, and we end up th- with 30 people, and everybody has a specialty, and they yeah. all bring something, and we all cook together, and and suddenly having 30 people doesn't seem like a chore. Right, yeah. Because no, it, it is. Like a wonderful thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an extraordinary, extraordinary experience. And I encourage all of you out there, by the way, who have gotten used to ordering in, not having gatherings, uh, but only having your gatherings virtually, to return to the day when you get together with people and you cook and you uh, uh, enjoy that community of food. Yeah. What about the conversation around the table? What was that like? Sure. I mean, you know, the day, how the day went, one era of time as a teenage yeah. boy who was brooding, you know, and... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Two girls who were probably fighting. Right. I think generally at the dinner table, um, it was a great moment to try to just be the family. You know, we had a lot of stories. My mom taught in the school system where we went. And so mm-hmm. you know, we would be talking about that. My dad would be talking about farming and with my brother. And I mean, we would just be talking about the regular day. Yeah, yeah. We have a tradition where we do roses and thorns. You know, I'm sure a lot of people know where you. Oh, that's a first. Please expand. No, it's just give me a rose and a thorn, which is about your day, and which opens the conversation up, which is what was the thorn? What was the worst thing that happened? And what was the best thing that happened? Or, you know, one of the best things that happened. So. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And we do it every night. My son's a freshman in high school. How was your day? Fine. Yeah, you know, exactly. Do, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you say, give me, you got to do a rose and thorn and you can't repeat the last person's, all of a sudden he'll say, well, you know, I, I had a solo in the, in the jazz band rehearsal and it went really well and it made mm-hmm. me feel good. And all of a sudden, and then we played this other song and this other kid had this other song, you know, and he's right. talking about what he does. And then the thorn is the real important one because then it's, I don't want to talk about it. Well, no, you have to say a thorn. Everybody's going to say a thorn. Yeah. And then it's, well, I saw blah, blah, blah. And it really made me do that. And then all of a sudden you're sort of having that need, that necessary break. Yes. Open, yeah. Need with your kid, you know? This is brilliant. Kelly. I don't even, I mean, I think, I mean, I've heard a lot of people who do it. I I definitely didn't make it up. Never heard of it. It definitely feels so useful and it's a tool. It's a definite tool. Oh, oh, it's wonderful. It's wonderful because it, 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 it's interesting because I, uh, one of my first theater experiences when I got out of uh, graduate school was I worked in an improvisational theater company. The guy who was running the company had trained with a woman named Viola Spolin, who was the mother of Paul Sills, who created Second City. Oh, right, right, right. But she originally created, and she has a, there's a wonderful book of theater games that she created. And essentially it is, you create a problem to solve a problem. Ah. The uh, creation of the problem is, you know, sometimes kids are, are reluctant to be physical in a love scene. So she created games where she required them as they're talking, you have to touch the other person. This is an example of creating a problem to solve a problem, which is you want to communicate, you want to find out what the, what the specifics are of your kid's day, but you need to, to frame it in such a way so that they have to solve a problem and to do it. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Yeah. And it seems very innocent because you're going to name something, but usually we don't talk about things that are hard. Mm-hmm. You know, like the, yeah. the human nature doesn't want to all the time, but if you just name it, yeah, then the floodgates open. You know, yes. then you're ready to go. Especially kids, yeah, especially and teenagers, kids. teenagers yes. too, particularly. So, conversation around the table was just very general, sort of uh, what was going on during the day, but it was sometimes revealing, sometimes not. Obviously, yeah. Did you guys ever go out to eat? Well, that was a very special deal. When you bring it up now, you're making me bring up all these things that I don't think about enough, yeah. which we go out all the time now. You know, we order in, we yeah. go out. Back then, listen, I didn't grow up. Like I told you in the very beginning, my dad went back and sort of changed our lives when he was in his 40s. But by that time, we were, by that time, we were mostly gro- getting grown. Mm-hmm. So as a kid, we didn't have that much money. You know, we were a farmer doesn't <laughs> make right. a lot of money. So we would spend one night a week, and this was every week, um, with my mom's parents, 
would have us over or we'd go out. There was one restaurant that we loved to go to in Elk City, Oklahoma called Loopy's. I still remember it because it was a very <laughs> big deal to go there and have, you know, their chimichanga. Yeah. Or we'd stay at their house and we'd order in something like pasta or pizza and salad. And my parents would sit in the living room with my mom's parents and my sister and brother and I would go watch TV or something in the other room after mm -hmm. we ate. Yeah. And that was a weekly occurrence, but it was something that we really looked forward to. But now I just point out the fact that we would go over to my dad's mom's and eat too, uh, at least once a week, either for Sunday after church, we'd have a big, you know, dinner or mm -hmm. something. And then every once in a while we'd go have Sunday, um, Sunday meal, either out like a brunch meal or something. And that was it. Dinner was home, yep. you know, uh, yep. you'd make dinner and it could be very simple or it could be something that you spend a little bit more time on, you know, mm -hmm. brown and beef and making spaghetti, you know, yeah. They were simple meals for both parents working. And, and my sister and I, when my mom went back to school too, to night school, I started cooking. I think about my own kids now being the age they are. Now, my son is a big cook. He loves to cook. But my sister and I were cooking by the time we were eight, nine, 10. Yeah. We, were, we were making the dinner. You mm -hmm. know, my mom would say, we have this, this in the fridge, you know, get it started and I'll be home or whatever. Right. But we would make the dinner. and. We would certainly fend for ourselves a lot. Yes. You know, and I am proud of that. You know, maybe yeah. it was, I don't know if it was lonely when we were kids, but now I think we were pretty darn independent, you know? Yes, yes. And it carries over. Oh, yeah. No, it, carried, it carries over into everything I, about how I am as an adult. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. very self-sufficient, and I know that comes from the fact that, and I think this is just generational, generational but we, we tended to be on our own for mm -hmm. most of the day. You yeah. know, making decisions, being out of the house. We certainly weren't pulled up just on a screen. You know, we were yes. we were out. We were out, and then we came home and we cooked ourselves dinner a lot of times. Mm -hmm. I remember one time my dad coming home, and it was just my dad and me. I think my mom had probably taken my sister somewhere, and I was going to make my dad dinner. And I remember I was eight years old, and I made the hamburger patty. I made a perfect hamburger patty, yeah. and I put it in the pan. And I, it got brown on one side and I turned it perfectly. It got brown on the other side. And then I put it on the bun and he came home and he was so nice. He was like, oh, look at this. And he took a bite and it was just <laughs> as red Raw. as the table. He was Raw. as red as the table beside you. <laughs> and he was, I told him this just recently. I was like, he, I remember him being nice about it. Thank, thank goodness. He said, oh, you know what? I'm just going to put this back in the pan for a couple of minutes. And he, he heated it through for himself, but he didn't, he didn't, <laughs> didn't make, make a big terrible. deal out of it. Right. No, but I thought I was doing so great. <laughs> <laughs> That's very funny. What about school food? Did you take lunch from home or did you eat at school? It's funny. I pack my kids lunch every single day, but I, I ate school lunch. And a lot of times I ate school breakfast mm -hmm. at school when they had it. I mean, they don't have sort of things like that anymore, school breakfast. Right. But because my mom had to be at school, you know, an hour earlier than the rest of us and I, I was, my only choice was to go with her. Ah, yes. She would go to her classroom to start preparing and I would be by myself and I would go to the cafeteria and I would often have school breakfast. Mm -hmm. I would have school lunch. And I remember a couple of times making my, my own lunch for myself, packing my own lunch and being really fancy, like thinking I was really cool when I did that. <laughs> I, I mean, I literally have a, a memory in second grade of, you know, heating up some Chef Boyardee or something and putting it in a thermos and, and right. taking it to school and being like, I made this. I made my own lunch. <laughs> <laughs> With such pride. Yeah. Such pride. Now, were you singing from a young age? I was. I didn't. I. I was about 10, nine or 10, because it was right around the time I started to sing at church. And I decided I would be in the, the uh, talent show at school. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even know what I would do. I thought, shall I dance? And, and remember, I was chubby. I, <laughs> I was going to do a big dance number. Well, should I do a jazz dance number? Being very, uh, not very good at dance. Or should I sing a song? And I remember thinking, I guess I'll sing. It just seems easier. And that was, I, I didn't know if I could sing really that well, and I sang, that's what friends are for, Dionne Warwick. Uh -huh. and <laughs> <laughs> and the, rest, the rest is history. My mom said, oh, she can sing, you know? And so then I started, started being more interested in it. Yes, and, and was, it, was it something that was uh, uh, fostered and uh, encouraged, or was it something that basically the, it was approached as, 
if you want to do it, you can do it. We'll figure something out. Both. I mean, I think my mom, I think they were sort of, neither my mom or my dad, now they're being modest. Both of them have great ears, you know. Um, my mom loved, grew up on music and her, my, her parents were both musical. And so she loved music. And so when I started to sing, she she definitely fostered, like I remember for Christmas that year I got, um, they gave me as a gift a little once a week voice lesson with this woman. And by voice lesson, she was a piano player and she'd play Disney songs and I'd sing with her. That was my, mm -hmm. I was about 10. So she, my mom was definitely fostering it, but they were both the kind of people that knew nothing about how to foster that really. Right, so, right. You know, I played in the band and I sang and then I sang at church. And as I got older and I started doing more things, my mom says she, they just were like, oh, okay. So it was one of those things where I said, I want to do that and I'm going to do that. But they didn't know. It didn't come from her. Oh no! They yeah. and in, and there there was nothing to there was nothing to push me toward. It wasn't right. like there were programs that were going to set me off to do this. No one knew that this was a profession at all. Right, the arts, acting, singing. In fact, they still don't really, in a lot no. of ways, um, <laughs> right. believe in it. Yeah, because I, I thought you know they love they love doing the high school plays and stuff, but no one yeah. thinks of it as a viable life. You know, no. I still I know that. No, no. My when I was growing up, my dad, you know, was a Greek immigrant. And my mother's parents were both immigrants, and the idea, just the idea, of thinking that you could go off into the world and make a career of acting yeah. and or and singing uh, was an anathema. Now, it wasn't just a, 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 a. I'm not sure how to deal with this. It was. You mean you want to be a gypsy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you want to travel in a caravan from town to town? <laughs> yeah. You want to go into outer space? Yes, you know, it, right. There was, I've talked about this, but there was one thing that happened to me as a kid. And this is why it's important for every kid to see something mm -hmm. that inspires them. There was, I was think it was five years old and Susan Powell was Miss America uh, that year. 1981 was her name. Her name was Susan Powell. She, mm -hmm. she was from Elk City. And there was ah. a there was an auditorium called the Susan Powell Auditorium where I did my school plays, and she came back to to town and and did an event there, and I was there, and I remember well, I sort of remember. My mom tells me more, but it was then and there that I said I want to sing. She sang opera, and I, I said I I want to sing like that, and I learned about this school with this woman named Florence Birdwell, which I called her the Bird Lady when I was five years old. And I said, mm -hmm. I'm going to do that. And that's just what I did. I went to Oklahoma City University and I studied voice with Florence Birdwell when I was oh. in college. Wow. And so something stuck in me from that right. age. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know how to sing. Even from five to 10 or nine or 10, I didn't sing at all because I didn't mm -hmm. have anywhere to sing. I didn't, mm -hmm. nobody said sing, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it wasn't until I did that talent show and then started singing with this woman and, and then that I started saying, well, well, gosh, I love this. This is my currency. This is my, mm -hmm. this is what I love. I, what right. I do. Right. Right. And also it's, and, and I, I, I would hope that, uh, those folks who are listening and or watching, um, who have children or who are young enough, uh, in, in their lives when they're still on a path to something that they find a moment in their life where they go, Oh, not only is this something I want to do, but these are my people. Mm. This is my cohort. This is where I fit mm -hmm. in life. Doesn't necessarily mean that you have to set yourself apart from everybody else yeah. uh, in what they do, but that we all have, I think, something in which we are in service to something else, to yeah. the world, to an audience, to... to uh, to entertaining, to providing laughter, whatever it is. At any rate, we, we were both lucky in that regard, I think. Totally uh, lucky. I, I wasn't from a very early time, but when I found it, it, it happened very quickly. So speaking of that, what happens when you are out on the road? For instance, I know you do a lot of concerts. You do, uh, uh, sometimes you do touring, or you are, uh, as we are uh, in general, when we're in this business, we're required to travel and go places. Uh, what do you do about your food health? How do you keep that? Uh, how do you keep a kind of constant flow of the kind of energy that you need um, in places where sometimes it's not available? I try not to get too neurotic as a singer. You know, oh, if I eat that, it's going to ruin my. I try not to do that. Yeah. But there are definitely things that I know that will not serve me 
And so, for instance, when we go down, we went down south last year, my my pianist and I, we travel all over the place together. And they were offering us at the theater, you know, they come and they want to feed you dinner. And well, we, our best, you know, our most favorite restaurant here, and it's barbecued ribs and mac and cheese. And I'm looking at it just right. salivating, right? You know, <laughs> right. this is my food. Can't right. have a bite of it. So I was thinking to myself, how do I get a hold of this at 9.30 p.m. when I'm finished with my When you're concert? done, <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, so then I'm, I'm sort of relegated to getting the salad with the grilled chicken or whatever it is that there's also on the menu. And yeah. I, don't, I don't like that, but it's, um, I, I do like the discipline of feeling my best. You know, mm-hmm. that it, I look back and I, I go, it's really served me to be in this, in this business because the comfort of food for me, the way I was raised with food and what it does for me um, emotionally it remains a gift to me because it's not something I've abused. Mm-hmm. It remains that gift of, well, I'll finish that concert and then I'm going to go get some barbecue riffs, you know, <laughs> right. or, I'll, or, you know, on my vacation, I'm, you know, I'm going to go and, and taste all the wonders of the place that I'm in and, and all the local, you know, offerings, you know, on, on my days off or, or after I sing right. but it, it, half of my time or three quarters of my time, I really, really take good care of myself. And I like the fact that I, I do both. I will never, it's like a moderation. I will never not have those things that, that bring me my grandma back, you know? Yes. And my mother. But I will do them uh, so that they always remain a, a special gift as opposed to something I'm just, uh, you know, I've overdone. Yes. Something you're shoveling down just because it's there. Yeah. I'm going to ask you for a recipe. Okay. We post recipes for all of our guests. Uh, doesn't matter what it is, yeah. Uh, but I'd like it specifically to be something that brings back, yeah, that time in your life when you were on the farm. Yeah, it's not fancy food. Think about a recipe, okay? Because I will, I, I'll hound you, okay? Until uh, and I know you're very busy. <laughs> well, it, it's not hard because when food is so important to me, I should just say that when we got married, Greg and I and his family too our favors for the get wedding guests were homemade, uh, our family recipes. Oh, we made a little booklet, a little book about 10 of his mom's and grandmother's favorites and my favorites from my side. And so that we could send that off with our, with our people and people call me still, they say, I still have that cookbook and I cook from it. So, I mean, it's easy for me just to pick one out of there. It may be part and parcel of the next question I'm going to ask you, which is, if there's one dish that you think of from your childhood or a moment in your life where you smell something or you taste something and it takes you back to a meal you had or a moment where you were sitting around the table uh, with your family or with a friend, at some point in your life, what's the most evocative food moment? I think it's just undeniably like the most amazing turkey and dressing <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. with, with my mom's, you know, giblet gravy and the way she makes it. I mean, you, people might think it's crazy, but she puts hard boiled egg and all the giblet. It's a weird mm-hmm. thing. It's like a very different kind of thing, but yeah. Thanksgiving is a very special one for us. And, and the way she makes her turkey, cause she doesn't care. She gets angry about a beautiful turkey because she thinks that means a dry turkey. So she's got oh, the, really? the breast, you know, you no, know, she's, it just tastes good. I might even embarrassingly say it's a tuna casserole. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not embarrassing at all. Absolutely. It was fast and easy and simple food, but mm-hmm. it always felt that, like it was filled with love, you know. That's the most important thing. And on that note, Kelly O'Hara, I can't thank you enough for joining me here on Cooking by Heart. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs>